Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second of our Faculty Insights series this summer. Uh, my name is Raghu Sundaram. I'm the Dean of NYU Stern, and I will be acting as the moderator for today's talk. It's uh, always a pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, any of Stern's extraordinary faculty, but today is a very special pleasure because Viral Acharya, who's the speaker today, was my student at Stern when he was doing his PhD uh, some 20 odd years ago. In fact, I think he might have even written his first paper, one of his first papers with me, and certainly got one of his first research awards with me. Since then, of course, he has gone on to become one of the most distinguished uh, members in all of the academic finance fraternity. Um, and Viral is not just an academic, as many of you know, he's also been an active policymaker. He spent two and a half years as Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, um, which is an extraordinarily difficult job because uh, it is also puts you in the political crosshairs quite a bit of the time. And um, Viral was caught in a, a bit of controversy there himself and handled himself with aplomb. So let me turn it over to Viral for today's talk. And as always, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A uh, uh, through the Q&A channel, and we will take those uh, questions after Viral has finished his talk. Viral, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Raghu. Uh, uh, I think what Raghu was trying to summarize very briefly is that I was a rising star until I met him, and after the award with him, I'm now a fallen angel. Uh, but uh, let me talk about uh, some other fallen angels uh, that are out there right now in the markets. Uh, and in a way, what I want to talk about is going to be a very natural uh, takeoff from where uh, Professor Aswad Damodaran left uh, last Tuesday. Uh, I was moderating his talk. Uh, those of you who were there uh, had seen it already, but for those who weren't, let me remind you that two of the striking facts uh, that Professor Damodaran drew attention to uh, were that uh, some uh, industries and sectors in the stock markets uh, have been hit much more severely than others. Uh, and two of the top ones that he mentioned in being the most severely affected were the banking sector and the energy sector. Uh, he also mentioned in the context of the energy sector that oil prices uh, had actually had a very different pattern over the last three, four months than, say, copper, uh, suggesting that uh, some other technical dislocations are at work there. Uh, I'm going to delve a lot more into both of these, but especially into the crash of bank stock prices uh, since mid-February that we have observed. Uh, this is joint work with Rob Engel, uh, uh, also of NYU Stern, uh, and Sasha Steffen, uh, who's at the Frankfurt School of Management. Um, and uh, let me stress that while I will focus on COVID-19 as the specific microscope I'm going to use to understand uh, the crash of bank stock prices, uh, my overarching goal is to uh, paint something which is, uh, which is a slightly longer term. Uh, which is that something happens episodically in causing bank stock prices to crash uh, every time uh, we have a significant shock to the economy. And I want to try and explain what that channel is. Why do the bank stock prices crash uh, and what can be done about it uh, going forward? So uh, let me start out by first uh, giving you a motivation as to what I'm talking about. Uh, so what I've done here is something relatively simple. Um, I've essentially plotted the stock price performance. Uh, let's look at the left uh, panel chart. And I'm going to do most of it through charts and a few numbers at the end. Um, you can see that all of these energy sector, banking sector, and other corporates, they've all been indexed to 100 uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, you can see that as the pandemic reaches the uh, shores of the Western economies and gradually starts uh, spreading uh, these prices correct. Uh, but you can see that the price correction is rather notable for banks, which are right at the bottom uh, of that graph. You can see that post the Federal Reserve and the Treasury packages being announced on 23rd of March, uh, there is a significant reversal 
in the stock prices of other corporates. In fact, as we speak, uh, at least as far as stock market is concerned, we are looking at uh, a very small uh, correction now in many of these uh, relative to mid-Feb. Uh, but you can see that the bank stocks have really languished. Uh, there's some pickup in the energy sector, but even that has uh, languished. And this is why I'm calling it a crash. Uh, it's not. It doesn't look something that's uh, that was just a temporary dislocation. Uh, the bank stock prices have remained subdued after having corrected for between 40 to 50 percent. Uh, they've essentially stayed flat, more or less, at that level. Now, and also what is peculiar, if you look at the right-hand side, now again, the banks are at the bottom, but now they are in the black thick line rather than the dashed line. The other dashed lines are other financial firms, broker dealers, insurance firms, uh, securities investment firms. And you can see that even there, uh, relatively speaking, the part of the financial sector that has done particularly poorly uh, in this last three months uh, is again, uh, the traditional banking or the depository sector. And this is what I want to try and uh, understand in some detail. Now, the focus of my talk for most part is going to be on the, the connection between the banks and the corporate sector. Most of the time we focus on banks uh, performing their intermediation function as one of extending loans uh, to companies. But the classic intermediation function that banks provide to corporations is actually not just of providing loans. In fact, increasingly large companies also borrow in the capital markets. They can go to the markets and get bonds, which in many ways looks as a similar intermediation function as getting a loan from a bank. Of course, there are differences because of maturity, collateral, covenants, and so on. But, but I would say that the primary function of banks that differs from what capital markets do is that banks provide liquidity insurance to companies. Banks allow companies to have prearranged lines of credit or credit facilities, which they can draw down at pre-agreed spreads based on their credit quality, not at the time of drawdown, but at the time that the facility has been put in place. Now, why is this important? This is important because if firms cannot rely on liquidity being available, so the analogy I like is that you're driving on a highway and if you can't fuel your car every now and then at a gas station, if you don't think the gas stations are going to be with fuel as you are driving, you are very unlikely to undertake uh, very large uh, or long uh, car journeys. The same way a corporation will not make long-term illiquid investments if they don't expect their liquidity needs, uh, unanticipated liquidity needs along the way to be met by the banking sector. Now, banks provide large quantum of these credit lines to the corporate sector. And when you get an event such as COVID-19, when other sources of funding dry down, banks become the first and actually the last resort of financing. Of course, I hate to use the word last because that's usually the central bank or the Federal Reserve uh, in case of the United States coming to the rescue. Uh, now, what, do you, what am I showing you here on the two plots? On the left plot, I'm showing you how large the drawdowns of these pre-arranged liquidity insurance facilities have been. In a short span of three weeks, uh, corporations in the United States, primarily lower grade corporations, but also the triple B rated corporations that face the risk of becoming fallen angels, uh, they drew down heavily on these bank credit lines. In fact, close to about $250 billion in less than a month. To, to put things in perspective, $250 billion was the size of the drawdown on bank credit lines in the entire year of 2008 of the global financial crisis. Okay, so this is quite an unprecedented intensity of the drawdowns. On the right-hand side, I'm showing that for those firms that did draw down their credit lines, and of course, the ones that drew down are the most affected by the pandemic. So the hospitality sector, the energy sector, the transportation sector, the airlines, these are the ones who have drawn down most heavily, but also the weaker corporations whose access to funding in markets has been affected significantly. 
On the right hand side, what I'm showing is that for the firms that drew down, they drew down close to 75 to 80 percent of their outstanding credit lines in the one month uh, that we had seen. Now, both of these are very, very large and intense liquidity demand from the corporate sector over a very short period of time and very large compared to annual outcomes in the past recessions, such as the 0102 or the 07, 08, 09 period. So, of course, there's a natural question, why do firms draw down credit lines? As I said, it's because there are other forms of financing uh, dry up and because for some, they risk being a fallen angel if they can't demonstrate to rating agencies and markets that they have enough liquidity to tide over their temporary cash flow problems, either direct cash flow hit to their business or rollover costs having gone up in commercial paper, bank loans, uh, and bond markets. So here's a quote uh, from Bloomberg, uh, right as uh, the markets were shaking up in middle of March, that borrowers are drawing down heavily on bank lines of credit, anticipating that market sources of funding may dry up or get costlier, especially the short-term commercial paper. But I want to stress this behavior was not limited to the best rated com non-financial companies that access the commercial paper. Uh, it was actually quite widespread even in the lower rating categories. Now, uh, one other point I want to stress here, of course, this was called as dash for cash uh, by, 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 by some journalists, uh, and, and it was actually pretty serious uh, as far as the bank balance sheets was concerned. Now, what I want to show you is that this crash of bank equity that has happened over the last few weeks has something to do with this phenomenon. The fact that banks provision of credit lines ahead of time before the pandemic is being used by the corporate sector in order to draw down liquidity uh, as their sort of resort financing uh, when other sources of funding are drying up. Now, from a risk sharing standpoint, of course, this might be entirely desirable that come, we don't want the productive capacity of the corporate sector uh, to wither uh, along with the pandemic. It's important for them to stay afloat. It's important for them to meet their operating leverage, financial leverage, and banks having prearranged this liquidity insurance function uh, are essentially providing it, and they have provided it. The reflection of that is this crash uh, in the bank stock returns that we just see. So in order to demonstrate this, I'm going to construct a very simple measure of balance sheet liquidity risk for banks. I'm going to uh, you look at three items, uh, two of which are their risks, and one uh, which is their defense against liquidity risk. The first risk are the unused commitments, as I mentioned. Uh, these are not just to corporates in general. They could also be to uh, through other forms of credit lines. They could also be uh, credit card facilities. They could be home equity lines of credit, et cetera. Uh, second source of liquidity risk is wholesale funding. While uh, banks have moved away very substantially from wholesale funding over the past 12 years, thanks to the reforms after the global financial crisis, nevertheless, it's important for some banks at least still to keep track of their reliance on uh, market finance, especially at the short term end. And of course, bank defense against the materialization of rollover problems and drawdown problems. So rollover problems with wholesale funding, drawdown problems with unused commitments are their cash and cash equivalents. So I'm going to subtract that from the two sources of liquidity demand on the banks and scale it by total assets uh, so that the measure is comparable across banks. Now, once I do that, uh, first, let me show you what the time series of this balance sheet liquidity risk measure looks like. Okay, What this uh, graph shows on the left-hand side is that the liquidity risk measure was about 33% of assets uh, on average uh, just before uh, the pandemic hit us. Uh, it is seven. It is about eight to ten percent smaller than its peak uh, before the global financial crisis hit. Nevertheless, there is a pattern here, which is that the vulnerability of the banking sector 
through pre through prearranged lines of credit through reliance on wholesale funds relative to their cash and cash equivalent assets had been rising steadily for about 2 years prior to the shock now of course no one could see the pandemic but i want to stress is that this vulnerability was actually rising and getting closer to the 2007 q3 levels there is a very important difference between the two peaks of the graph on the left hand side which is that if you divide the liquidity risk contribution coming from credit lines which is in the gray uh, squares versus uh, uh, the wholesale funding uh, sorry the dark uh, gray bars at the bottom are the credit lines and the light gray bars at the top as wholesale funding you can see that in 2007 almost the entire component of liquidity risk was due to wholesale funding in contrast wholesale funding has dramatically deteriorated nevertheless its space has been filled up through this surge in credit lines since 2015 and especially uh, over the last uh, uh, last few quarters Uh, now, how am I going to use this? I'm going to use this measure before the pandemic hit. So, I'm going to use the measure as of first January of 2020 to divide banks into high liquidity risk and low liquidity low liquidity risk banks. Okay, those who are exposed to a sudden uh, stop of uh, rollover finance or a sudden macro shock uh, versus those who are relatively immune. and what you see is that even though both suffer the incremental performance of the high liquidity risk banks is about 10% worse as shown in the right graph the difference between the two shows that the liquidity risk is being punished by an incremental 10% okay this this makes two points one is that something happened which is perceived to be a risk to all banks not just those who are liquidity risk Uh, and we have to try and understand that but that banks who are exposed to liquidity risk as as i showed you in case of the pandemic more through credit lines have been punished by an extra 10% uh, in the markets uh in fact uh, if you want to see this graphically uh, you can see on the left hand side i have just regressed the bank stock returns in a very simple y versus x plot against liquidity risk and you can see this negative slope uh, banks that had higher liquidity risk in the spectrum you can see between the two extremes of the liquidity risk values uh, there's a differential pattern of about 20% uh, in the stock market crash now what's very interesting and this is a point that our colleague at altman makes repeatedly is that in the benign phase of the credit cycle uh, there is virtually no risk premium uh, in the markets so uh, on the right hand plot what i have done is something very simple so in your co- corporate finance classes with aswar damodaran uh, or otherwise uh, you would have run the capm regressions and when you run the capm regressions if you regress uh, the stock on its beta you basically get what one might think of as the market uh, risk premium uh these risk premia estimated as of january or february were practically close to zero that's the red vertical line neither liquidity risk nor even the market risk were very significantly priced for banks uh as of january and february and you, and you see this episodic ignition uh, the risk ignited the risk premium has now become large if you recall last week Uh, professor damodaran said that based on his survey the risk premium actually went up by a by a good 3% from 4.75% to 7.75% uh, of course the the market prices were not even reflecting a 4.75% or now arguably these are very short period estimates nevertheless using a similar short period estimate in march you can see that the pricing of both beta and liquidity risk has become very very significant uh, in the markets so uh, that explains the liquidity risk component as i said though it may not just be all liquidity risk uh, maybe the pandemic and the loss of productive capacity the reorientation of uh, of style of consumption that might result as a result of this is a permanent shock to certain kinds of uh, businesses uh, and so there may just be credit risk uh, that has gone up on bank balance sheets of course that doesn't fully square up with why the corporate 
sector has rebounded so well in the stock market, but the banks haven't rebounded. And I want to explain that, yes, indeed, there is a credit risk component here. This is the second important point. But the component of credit risk that banks are suffering the most from is actually linked to their fossil fuel exposures. It's linked to their exposure to the oil sector, uh, especially in the United States, as you know, the shell gas uh, explorations and the existing capacity is not that profitable, even at the presently rebounded levels of uh, oil prices. Now, why is this a potential candidate? It's for this simple reason that if you look at the left-hand chart on these two graphs, uh, the oil volatility has basically reached almost unprecedented levels in the last few months. Uh, the oil price volatility measured as CVOX index reached a peak of 300% uh, on the day of the big crash when the OP OPEC could not agree to the uh, supply cuts. Uh, and it still remains close to 80%. Now, this is very important because VIX, which is also another uh, market uh, uh, gauge of fear uh, or a fear index, has actually come back very sharply from its peak of 80% down to between 20 to 30%. This, however, has not been the case for oil price volatility. All indicators of oil price vol in the markets are right now uh, between 80 to 100%. Uh, they have not corrected much. It suggests that the problems being seen in this sector are extraordinarily high. Um, uh, a, a global recession or a consumption slowdown will hurt this sector very significantly. Uh, Ed Altman and, and uh, has been uh, quoted and cited in many papers uh, showing that some of these sectors have been gearing up for distress steadily over the last few years. And in fact, on the right hand side, if you look at the two day adjusted return of banks, adjusted for their liquidity risk exposure, adjusted for their beta, two-day return right around the oil price crash, uh, you can see that on the x-axis, banks that had high exposure to the oil and gas sector through their loans as a percentage of their tier one capital uh, again got hammered uh, quite heavily. Okay, uh, what about other industries? Is credit risk high also in other industries? It seems uh, it's there, but less so. Uh, you can actually see that most of the rebound in the non-financial corporates that I was showing to you earlier has happened in sort of non-oil non gas sector. The oil gas is the thin dashed line right at the bottom. It's, it's sort of like banks, it's crashed, it's not really picking up again. These are loan returns. You see something very similar in the stock market returns as well. I'm showing you loan returns partly to show that even after the Federal Reserve's uh, rescue measures and trying to put a floor, these loans are not going in the secondary markets uh, at actually prices which are a far cry from their lowest prices. Uh, you can see that the loans to oil and gas they, are, they, were, they went down to 75 to 80 cents on a dollar. That's a 20 to 25% correction. Uh, there is not that much recovery in the prices of these. And of course, now if I throw in this oil exposure to tier one capital as another risk factor that is getting episodically priced in the markets, once again, you see January, February, literally no risk premium on any risks in explaining the cross section of bank stock returns. Uh, and there is a very large uh, loading on oil exposure and uh, to tier one capital. And it's in fact larger than the liquidity risk, explaining that a big chunk of the correction has actually happened uh, because of these oil exposure. You can add in other sectoral exposures. And, and what is striking is that it's really the bank exposure to the oil sector that helps understand what's happening uh, to the stock price performance. So I would say, Two big things to watch out for as far as bank performance going forward is concerned. What is the likely drawdown on their credit lines? And two, how is the performance of the oil sector? These two remain the primary risks based on the data that we have seen over the last three months uh, in the bank returns. Now, uh, I, I, 
one question that often gets asked is, oh, is the pandemic different? And of course it is different. Uh, it's a very different kind of a shock uh, compared to uh, the global financial crisis. There, the crisis was deeply rooted uh, in the housing sector, perhaps fueled through both public policy as well as uh, poor underwriting standards in mortgage uh, lending by banks and, and non-banks. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would tend to think that as far as bank outcome is concerned, these kinds of shocks make me think that while history may not exactly repeat itself, as far as banks are concerned, it rhymes. Okay, so I, I did exactly the same exercise using the liquidity risk measure that I constructed using by constructing it as of January 2007. I already showed you that there it was wholesale funding reliance, which was the biggest contributor, not the extension of corporate credit lines. Now, if you go to about January 2008, uh, which is about six months into the global financial crisis, you can once again see that the market was differentially pricing the high and the low liquidity risk banks by about 10%. Now, if you project that forward all the way until collapse of Lehman Brothers, this difference widened to about 50, 40 to 50%, as you see on the right-hand side. The right-hand side is the difference between the stock performance of the high and the low liquidity risk banks. Uh, and you can see that, and we actually verify that this pricing of the balance sheet liquidity risk is episodic. Virtually no pricing until Q2 of 2007. And once the crisis hits, the stock market is discriminating between banks based on their balance sheet exposure to wholesale funding and credit line drawdowns. So uh, I think there is very much a pattern here that repeats every time there is a large uh, shock, large enough to create problems in wholesale markets, large enough to cause uh, growth prospects to come down, large enough to cause global equity markets to correct in a significant way. Okay, so why is this important? This is important because now we can ask the question, and this is my third point, what do we do with all this? Uh, and uh, I'm gonna focus on the liquidity risk aspect because presumably the Federal Reserve is working hard on the stress tests to get at least the direct credit risk exposure such as to the energy sector right. They will ask banks to hold uh, the right levels of uh, capital when this comes about. But because this liquidity risk is off balance sheet, uh, you know, it's not materialized as a rollover problem or as a drawdown, it's an off balance sheet risk. Uh, and because it is so episodic, it's important to include it in the stress tests because that's the only way you can limit the kind of carnage of bank stock prices that we have seen from happening forward. I would in fact say that the differential pricing of credit risk right now is only about 10%, which is Jan 2008 levels. If the slowdown continues, if corporate credit drawdowns continue for another two, three quarters, we could easily see a further widening between the exposed banks and the less exposed banks. Okay, so what do I want to do? I want to quickly show you how all this can be put to good use to come up with a number as to how much capital we should ask banks to raise and why I think we should do this ASAP. Of course, it will have to be the regulators who do this. Okay, so I looked at a pattern of how much does the corporate sector draw down as a function of the S&P 500 decline. The left-hand side is a microscope within the pandemic. The right-hand side graph is a longer time series microscope over all the stressed quarters of the last two decades. Okay, So that includes the GFC 2001-2002, uh, uh, some of those periods, and then uh, the recent stress. And what you see on the left-hand side is, is a very steep slope. That steep slope implies that if there's a 40% correction in the market, a global market decline or an S&P 500 market decline, out of the total credit lines that are outstanding, you will see between 30 to 40% of a drawdown. Uh, and the right-hand chart uh, gives uh, something very similar. So what can we do with this? I'm going to say that we can use this to conduct a stress test. It will be a pandemic stress test given the numbers we use right now, but otherwise it's going to look like a stress test to a large shock. Now, as you know, at the Volatility and Risk Institute, uh, founded by Rob Engel and presently uh, run and managed by Rob Engel and Professor Dick Berner, 
we calculate a measure uh, overnight called S risk, which tells you the capital shortfall of an individual bank in case of a crisis. I won't bore you with all the formula, but roughly what it tries to do is to simulate a stress test in an, in an academics computer. It asks the question, suppose there was a 40% correction to the global stock market. If I wanted a bank to have in that correction scenario, at least 8% of market equity value relative to its total liabilities, will it have that much equity value or will it have a shortfall? And if it does have a shortfall, how much? Okay. So we calculate these numbers. It requires you to calculate what's the downside exposure of the equity. Clearly, you know the equity value today. So you have to project an LRMES, which is just a, a acronym for when the stock market corrects by 40%, what is the correction, say, in Bank of America stock or JP Morgan stock? That would be captured in the LRMES. Now, we make two important assumptions which is what I'm going to adjust. One is that we assume whatever you see are the debt liabilities today on the balance sheet, they will be the debt liabilities in future. Uh, why is this important in the context of my presentation that I just showed you so far? It's because there are these undrawn credit lines which are unstated, not on balance sheet liabilities of banks. Second, LRMES is calculated using small shocks of about 1% to 2% to extrapolate what would happen in a 40% crash scenario. But what I just showed you is that liquidity risk gets episodically priced by the stock market. It's not there, and suddenly the risk premium ignites. And so I'm going to show you how to correct for this in the stress test that we do. Now, this measure itself, once the vulnerability and the stock price correction has already happened, shows that the capital shortfall estimates increase by about 600 billion from January to March. And it's very important to understand why the estimate goes up. Clearly, the oil sector exposure and the deterioration in its quality explains a big chunk of it. But I want to show you that about 200 billion, so about one third of this, can be attributed to liquidity risk. So what am I going to do? I'm going to assume make two corrections. The first correction is to recognize that debt at a future point of time on a financial sector the firm's balance sheet is its today's debt plus some drawdown rate in a market correction scenario times the outstanding credit lines. Okay, And that's going to give an incremental S risk because now you're going to need capital. Once these drawdowns happen and loans come on balance sheet, you'll need capital against that as well. And further, the episodic risk premium in these large market correction states uh, is going to imply that the downside beta or the LRMES of the bank stocks is actually far greater than what we might estimate or extrapolate from local 1% to 2% market corrections. So there's going to be an incremental S risk because of the erosion in equity that's going to take place because of, let's call it, some kind of uh, uh, market risk premium, which could also be a leverage effect uh, in part. So when I do these calculations, what do I find? Three big things. One, the predicted drawdowns as a function of market correction for 40% would be on the order of 30 to 50%, depending on which recession you look at. That's number one. Number two, if I do bank by bank calculations, therefore, of the incremental capital shortfall that they will face because of these off balance sheet liabilities, focus on, say, the fourth column, which has the most extreme assumption of a 50% drawdown, that from the top 10 banks, we would have an additional $60 billion capital requirement. And point three, if you repeat this for the extra correction due to the repricing, again, I won't go through the mechanics of the calculation, but basically the various slopes that I've estimated, the measure of the liquidity risk, all of these imply that for the top 10 banks, then if you again focus on the rightmost column, there would be an additional $122 billion of capital requirement. Put it all together, and this is going to be uh, my, my sort of last number. Uh, in all, it says that ideally we should be asking banks right now, all banks, if you take about two, slightly over $200 billion of capital, because this is due to 
credit lines and liquidity risk that was not being priced, that were not being drawn down upon, they are being drawn down upon, it is being priced in the market, it's time to redo our capital calculations. So first and foremost, of course, regulators need to preserve bank capital. So they have to, I think they should just require a blanket suspension of any payouts, not just share buybacks, but also dividends. But that's not going to be enough. Uh, they need to immediately ask banks and systemically important financial institutions to raise capital. Back of the envelope numbers suggest uh, it should be at least $200 billion. It's not sufficient to nudge them. They will not do it on their own. It's going to be too late to do this if the pandemic outcome is not pleasant because then banks will be even more reluctant to do it on their own and the cost of equity capital will rise and any bank that individually goes out to the market will essentially be, uh, it will be a kiss of death for them because they would not want to be the first one to raise equity. Also, if regulators do the stress tests now and then say banks need capital, it's going to be a very adverse signal. This is a point that Professor Yakov Amihut has been making quite a bit, which is that no, Ask them right now, based on common information that we have, that bank stock prices have lost value. They are not correcting. Energy sector has lost value. It's not correcting. Loan prices are not correcting. And credit lines are getting drawn down. You have all the public signals. Do some simple back of the envelope calculations. If the capital we ask for banks turns out to be too much, it can always be returned two or three quarters down the line. Uh, it would be a very small cost to pay right now, in my view, for a very significant hedge against financial fragility risk. Uh, and I showed you this fan chart of how banks' liquidity risk problems manifested in stock prices from January 8 onwards. We clearly don't want to be in that scenario. I think the regulators were too late in asking for bank capital then. Uh, I think it's time to do it upfront rather than later. Let me stop there. Uh, I think we may have to start thinking about broader issues down the line. Should we just worry about a pandemic? Is a pandemic linked to zoonotic diseases uh, increasing in their frequency because of global warming? If yes, what are the other kinds of shocks we might see? Uh, I think much food for thought uh, from the market data that we see out there. Let me stop here, Raghu, and take questions. Yeah. Um... So I'm going to ask you uh, a, a, a broad question first. It's going to come from me. Um, a lot of what you've been talking about has to do with liquidity in the banking sector. But you're not only an academic, you're, you've also been a central banker. Wearing both hats, we went into this really low interest rate environment 12 years ago which has led to an incredible inflation of asset prices. And we have seen no attempt at going back to a normal interest rate regime. And now we're back in a crisis mode, back in like providing liquidity to the markets. When the Fed balance sheet exceeded $2 trillion a decade ago, everyone raised their eyebrows. Now it's like $6 trillion climbing and we've become almost inured to what is going on. What is your feeling about where we are in terms of Central banking in this context, in this liquidity provision context, and where do you see us coming out of this? And most importantly, what do you see the implications as being for long term growth? This. Yeah, uh, no, this is a great question, Raghu. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can spend the entire afternoon today uh, discussing it, but I'll try my best to sort of give, give it in short nuggets. Uh, three points. Uh, one, of course, I focused on the risk of the financial sector and the liquidity risk being faced by companies uh, and being met through lines of credit. Uh, what we have to recognize is that while the households were deleveraging over the last decade as a whole, uh, the public sector balance sheets uh, were adding massive debts, uh, even otherwise, in most of the developed economies. Now, we are beginning to reach levels of public debt where one has to at least entertain the scenario that the policy responses in developed economies may start facing difficult trade-offs that have been historically faced only in emerging markets. Uh, what I mean by this is, will there be financial repression? Will we have to force banks and others in the financial sector to keep funding government debt so that debt sustainability doesn't become a problem before growth is on a firmer footing? Uh, 
Uh, if you don't do that and the private sector growth is catching up in parallel, uh, you could see all kinds of cost of capital effects bubbling into uh, product prices. Uh, you might even face central banks uh, getting fiscally dominated and having to monetize the rollovers of government financing and focusing on inflation, as you know, Tom Sargent in his famous work explained that the central bank gets distracted uh, and has to focus on avoiding a debt sovereign debt crisis rather than focusing on inflation. Now, of course, when you do that, you still have to face the inflation costs uh, that are arising on the side. Uh, so uh, first, I want to say that we have to seriously entertain two really bad scenarios, in my opinion, which are at opposite extremes. One is a financial repression, which would be low productivity, low growth, and likely deflationary versus a very high risk scenario in which you have a sovereign debt sustainability problem, but high inflation uh, and with likely attendant consequences on the safe haven status of some of these countries. So two really horrible scenarios, in my opinion, that we have to start attaching significant probability to. Uh, second, coming back a little bit to the discussion that I had, um, I think a key question for me, and I think uh, uh, my, my sort of thought uh, for the regulators is that it is time to accept that the way monetary policy is being practiced, it is primarily working in transmission, if at all it is working through leveraging. So first we used monetary policy to lever up the households. Then we used it to help lever up the sovereigns uh, to get out of the global financial crisis. Then when growth was didn't rebound, in spite of the leveraging of the sovereigns, we enabled the corporate leveraging uh, in process. Now, whether you like it or not, if that is the mechanism through which monetary policy works, for sure, the vulnerability to shocks in the system goes up. And I think this point is not being adequately recognized. It's not good enough that your banking system is stable because if the underlying dislocation for leveraging, which is extremely low rates and promise for low rates and promise to do whatever it takes and promise to accommodate any liquidity risk is out there, leveraging will happen directly on the corporate balance sheets. It will happen through shadow banking markets. And I think this transmission of monetary policy through leveraging through whoever can take leverage uh, in the system is, I think, something that needs to be taken head on because it's, it says that you need a system-wide perspective on leverage rather than just a banking sector perspective on leverage. And I think we have seen it manifest. I think the scale and the pace of Federal Reserve actions is both un unprecedented and while I think I give them a lot of credit for going through an ember light with a lot of decisiveness, uh, you know, you don't want to drive through an ember light and just rest in the middle of the box. I think they've kind of driven through it very quickly. Uh, I give them credit for it, but I, I think I'm sure when they reflect, they're going to ask the question, how did we end up providing liquidity, including to hedge funds uh, indirectly through distressed funds and so on. Uh, and third question, and I'm going to tie this again to the financial sector, even banking sector stability, is that entertain a scenario in which growth picks up, inflation picks up, and the Federal Reserve has to raise rates in an environment when public debts have gone up very significantly. The classic trade-off that emerging market central banks have faced is, oh, if I raise rates, bond prices will correct and there will be collateral damage on the balance sheet of the financial sector when I do that. Now, this is a concern, and, and in my view, while I did not present this as the reason why I'm asking that the banking sector be capitalized, there's going to be all sorts of collateral benefits of having a more stable banking sector. If we ask banks to be capitalized, I think the Federal Reserve and other central banks will exonerate themselves from having to keep rates low, even when inflation is actually picking up in the economy, because otherwise there's going to be this bloodbath which is that everyone who is loaded up on government bonds at the first sign of a reversal in the interest rates, and when they see that low for long is no longer the norm, there's going to be a massive correction that's going to happen in the market values of all these financial players. So I would say first and foremost, financial stability of the banking sector. Second, take a systemic view. And third, I think it's time to draw a line and recognize that at some point, many of these policies directly or indirectly are helping fuel the public sector bond bubble. Uh, 
Uh, when that crashes, it's not going to be very pleasant because there are two forks in the road, as I said, repression or hyperinflation, and neither is going to look very, very good. Maybe hyperinflation is too strong a term. I just mean to say that it may be higher than the target levels of inflation we are comfortable with in Western economies. Um, so there are two questions that are related. So I'm going to ask both of them together. Uh, one is a question from Dick Burner. So Dick says he loves the analysis, but why raise capital in the crisis? Should we not have asked for higher capital requirements ex ante based on your analysis of contingent claims and liquidity interactions? Uh, absolutely. Let me ask the second question also. Yes, related. Yes, yes, yes. The second comes from Rob Engel who says this is essentially an insurance product. Insurance companies take something like expected losses as a liability. Should this be reported for banks too? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Dick and Rob, for these questions. Uh, I think a part of reason for doing these exercises is that going ahead, we can actually construct these numbers uh, and in fact add them to the ex ante capital shortfall that the banks would have. Nevertheless, uh, I would say uh, it's it's never too late to raise capital in my view. Uh, I think to paraphrase Mervyn King, he used to say that uh, the, the, the best early warning signal you have of a crisis is that you are in the middle of one. Uh, because, you know, it's very hard to predict when a shock will hit. In fact, that's the spirit of our S-risk work, which is that we don't want to say what's going to cause a 40% market correction. It will happen at some point. And the question is, are we positioned well? So I would say... Uh, let bygones be bygones. We didn't ask for extra capital, but I think it is better to ask for capital now than say in a scenario that looks like the Q3 of 2008, which at least right now we can't rule out based on the real economic outcomes that we are seeing, even though the stock market uh, seems to be seems to have recovered quite well. Uh, I fully agree with Rob that greater transparency on these lines of credit would help. In fact, there is transparency. These data are out there in the Thomson Reuters deal scan database. They are relatively larger syndicated lines. Uh, the smaller credit lines, which accumulate to a large number, are also available uh, with the regulatory system. Uh, and of course, in the call reports, uh, annually banks do report their complete exposure. We could ask them for greater uh, frequency. We could ask them for the specific fees that they are charging on these products. Uh, and all of this could be used to good effect in our stress test calculations. Okay. Thanks, Farrell. Now, two questions on methodology and, uh, and outcome. This is from Alan who that related questions again. One is, how does your measurement of bank capital compare to the Fed's measurement? And related to that is, why are you using market capitalization, which is obviously much more volatile than book capital? Uh, these are both great questions, uh, Alan, and they really get at the heart of uh, the S-risk calculation. Uh, first, let me give the practical answer, uh, pragmatic answer, which is that we don't have the balance sheet granularity of bank exposures that a regulator does. So to conduct a regulatory stress test, unfortunately, you have to be the regulator. Uh, it's not possible to do that level of mapping from macro scenarios into asset class by asset class losses. In contrast, market data is available. Uh, markets are pricing and repricing risks on a daily basis. By and large, markets do collect intelligence on where the exposures are. Uh, and, 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 you know, part of what I'm trying to show you is that markets make sense. I think this was Aswad Damodaran's point even last week, which is that markets seem to price risks in a relative sense quite well. I think market risks have this episodic feature. The risk premia do tend to be very small. They tend to be pro-cyclical. But in the cross-section, they do seem to price stocks correctly based on liquidity risk or oil exposure risk. So that's one point. Now, second, uh, a more real, a more uh, a deeper answer rather than the pragmatism of using market value is that in a crisis, what matters is, in my opinion, not regulatory capital is whether you can go to the markets and raise financing or not. In fact, if you look at 2008, virtually no bank that failed was failing regulatory capital requirements. 
they all met regulatory capital standards. And yet we had a full-fledged banking crisis on our hand in the global financial sector. Okay. Now, why is that? It's because no matter what the regulator's marks are, the markets are saying, I don't think the market value of the book is the same as what the regulatory value uh, of the book marks is. Now, this may be risk premium related. It may be because book values don't recognize losses until they materialize, whereas market values anticipate these losses. Whatever the reason be, I think it's immaterial. If a bank cannot go out in the market and borrow to meet its liquidity needs, it's toast. It, can, it will have to go to the regulator to borrow in the lender of last resort facilities. And there are limits there up to the amount of collateral. So once the confidence in the market is lost on a banking system, it's just too late. You can't say at this point, listen, I, my banks are well capitalized on regulatory capital standards. How does it matter that their equity is going to zero? It's, it really doesn't quite cut it. Uh, in fact, uh, European regulators tried this in the first uh, early stress tests of 2011 and 12, where some of the banks that had the risky European sovereign exposures were penalized the most in the markets, but they were the best capitalized by regulatory capital standards because the regulatory risk weight on sovereign bonds is zero. So I think we cannot ignore market values. In fact, I would say a good regulatory capital requirement would be one that is a little bit ahead of the market. It, it's always actually requiring banks to be well capitalized compared to the scale of erosion that is actually happening uh, in, in the market value of bank balance sheets. So there's a question, another question Alan has posted, which feeds almost directly off your last line. Mm -hmm. uh, your line about staying ahead of the market. So this question says, your measurement of bank capital needs might increase capital to such an extent that it reduces bank ROEs to the point that investors refuse to put up capital for the sector. Uh, I think this is the standard argument that has been that has been made. Note that when banks raise equity, uh, they will be asked to repay some of their wholesale finance as a result of this. So the reason why ROE comes down is because the leverage of the bank will come down. It's not because actually inherently the returns to the underlying franchise of the bank is coming down. What we should be focused on uh, for the system as a whole is the return on assets of the bank. We don't have to be bothered on what the return specific to the shareholders are. Think about the financial crisis. Uh, we focus too much on ROE of banks and didn't ask them to raise capital in good time. And it is the effective creditors of the banking system, the taxpayers like you and me and everyone else in this uh, forum, uh, who basically ended up paying for the bank bailouts. So I think we have to focus on the return on assets of the bank. We have to factor in the cost of the taxpayer put. Uh, ROE of the bank goes up and down, primarily because of the leverage of the bank. Because risks have gone up, it's time to bring the leverage of the bank down. That has to be the focus of the public policy, not what return the shareholders are earning from making investments or not making investments. Um, so Menachem has asked a question uh, that I was also thinking of as you were presenting. Your, your analysis is almost completely on the US. Um, to what extent does your analysis extend to Europe, to Asia, to other countries? Um, and also there's a clarificatory question that Larry has asked. Uh, 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 what are you defining as banks in your analysis? Are Goldman and Morgan Stanley concerned banks in your analysis? As, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so let, let me start with the last question, Larry. Uh, Goldman and Morgan are now banks uh, in the sense that they are bank holding companies. So they would be included. They don't do as much traditional banking yet. Uh, of, of course, they are, as you know, always trying to get into more and more traditional banking activities as we speak. Uh, but they would not show up as large. In contrast, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells, these are the four banks which have the largest extensions of uh, lines of credit. And you will see that their corrections have also been the largest, uh, both in terms of actual drawdowns, uh, as well as in terms of the market corrections uh, over this period. Uh, coming to Minakam's point, uh, the behavior on corporate credit lines is somewhat different between US and Europe. My co-author Sasha Stefan and our colleague Tony Saunders has documented this. 
there seemed to be uh, a somewhat more of a, a slow a slow uh, withdrawal of credit lines in Europe compared to US, uh, where the drawdowns are very, very massive. Uh, I think this has something to do with the fact that US companies are quite reliant on shadow banks. Uh, they're quite reliant on bond markets. Uh, and so when a shock uh, such as the global financial crisis or COVID hits uh, and the shadow banking markets come to a screeching halt, uh, they immediately have to revert back to bank finance. Uh, and the way they do it is through drawdowns of credit lines. Uh, in Europe, by contrast, they don't have access to as deep bond markets. So they are already heavily reliant on banks to start with. Uh, and then the drawdowns on the bank credit lines are actually not as heavy. So uh, one perspective that could be taken on this is that uh, the growth of the shadow banks uh, in the U.S., which basically feed off the very low risk premium uh, in the expansionary phase of the economy and the Federal Reserve's rate cycle, uh, actually create uh, a sort of a fragility in the financing of the corporations. Uh, the banking sector through credit lines provides a backstop to this fragility, uh, but of course it does so in a way uh, that erodes its uh, stability in the process. And then the question becomes, are they holding enough capital to bear this shock and continue intermediation in a good way when the shock materializes? Uh, and I think that was the spirit of the stress. I think, let me stress, my biggest concern with lack of capital on the bank balance sheets is that the large companies will have liquidity insurance through the banking system. They are not the ones who are going to be starved of credit. It's going to be the household cost of credit, the cost of credit for small businesses, and the cost of credit for unrated firms. Uh, which is going to uh, rise significantly if banks become undercapitalized. And I think that loss of intermediation will be felt far more in the end in the real outcomes such as jobs, consumption, and so on. Thanks, uh, Viral. I think we are out of time, but if you'd like to take one last question, this is uh, back to Dick Banner. Dick asks, he says, your point about systemic leverage is critical and asks essentially, what do you suggest that authorities like FSOC and FPC should do now? Uh, I have a simple uh, rule that I have been recommending, though I've never actually, I think, formally written up anywhere, which is that if the safety net uh, is extended directly to a class of players, such as money market funds, hedge funds, distressed investors, bond investors. From the next day onward, the Federal Reserve, if it extends lender of last resort, it should have the right to regulate their capital structure. If they can't regulate the capital structure, they should not provide liquidity to that part of the system. To me, the carrot and the stick, and I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting something even simpler. There could, there could a case be made that the provision of the safety net should be taken as given, and therefore we should regulate the capital structure ahead of time. I'm saying, I'm asking something simpler. I'm saying exposed if you extend a lender of last resort to a new class of shadow banking players from that day onwards, you must have the rights to regulate their capital structure. Otherwise, we are just socializing risks and privatizing the profits. And you know, that can't, it just can't be that you can get right pricing of risk. I think this maybe goes back to Ed's question. Why is there so much froth in the expansionary phase? Maybe because the implicit safety net is never being uh, attached with, with a stick to at the end. We are never asking the shadow banks to really regulate their capital structures in a macro prudential systemic uh, fashion. Uh, thank you, Raghu. Uh, thank you, thank you and for- Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Raghu. It's always uh, great to catch up with you, even if on Zoom. I miss our lunches, but I also miss seeing all our other colleagues and students, and I hope all of you stay safe. Uh, during the rest of the summer. Thank you. We will be back in the building shortly. Yes, looking forward to that. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, always optimistic. Yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, admin team, for the, uh, for the tech support as always. Mm -hmm.